Heavenly Father, we come before you right now, Lord. Father, we come humbled before you right now in utter awe at your magnificence right now, Lord. Yes, Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you just for the opportunity to lift up the praises of, of Zion to you this morning, Lord. Father, we thank you, Lord. Lord, we just, we give you every ounce of what we have this morning, Lord. And we thank you for, for growing us and for maturing us and allowing us to experience just a glimpse of what it will be like in glory. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Father, when we get, some people wonder, is that all we will do is worship you, Father? When we get to, is that all that will happen? But, Lord, I contend the challenge that as we stand before the wonder of you face to face with our creator, with the magnificent one, the alpha and the omega, the one who, who spoke uh, uh, life into existence, how could we respond any differently but to worship you, Lord? How could we even pull away from you to do anything else but worship you? Father, we don't claim to know the mysteries of heaven. We thank you for your word that just gives us a glimpse, uh, just a, a teaspoon of what it will be like so that, Lord, we can just start getting ready, Father God. But, Lord, until you take us home, until you come and receive us, Lord, Father, we ask that we embrace your holy word, Lord, and, Father, that we speak it, teach it, and, 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 and reverence it. Lord, with everyone we come in contact with, Lord, so that they could come to know the joy that is in our heart. They can come to know it for themselves. Father, as we move forward in the service today, Lord, we ask that this spirit of freedom and liberty that's in the house right now remain. Holy Spirit, please don't move. Stay right where you are. Stay right where you are, planted on holy ground in this house right now. The rest of the world looks for other spirits to haunt them, but Holy Spirit, you haunt this house in this season right now. We turn this over to you, Lord. Hallelujah. We pray to you. We, we adore you. We reverence you in the mighty, majestic, glorious never-ending, eternal name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Amen, amen, amen. You may be seated in the house. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For those of you who are just joining us online, <laughs> I, I would wish to apologize, but I can't. All I can say is you, you should have been here. <laughs> That's why we're, we're starting at 1055, but if you should have been here, for what we uh, just experienced. We had our own encounter with God this morning, and, and he's still here in this house. Amen? Amen. 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 We are going to continue to uh, work through Revelation. I, 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 I don't know how long I will be in the book of Revelations. It could be till Christ comes back. I don't know. Um, but he has not uh, allowed me to move on from this teaching as of yet. And uh, so we're going to stay there. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 5 today. So if you would, turn in your Bibles, your cell phones, whatever you have. Turn to Revelation uh, 5 today. Revelation 5. So this morning as we continue on this journey through Revelations, I want you to know that chapter 5 really provides details and sets the tone for what our eternity in heaven will be like. It sets the tone for what it will be like. Here we see John. We know that, that John last week, we told you that he was called up to heaven and he walked in that door in heaven. And, and, and as he walks in the door and as he's overwhelmed by the glory that he, that he partakes in, he, he is drawn into the business of heaven. How many of you know that there will be business conducted in heaven? That heaven is not club met. You're not just going to go there and sit on a hammock and swing um, and drink iced tea or, or lemonade or anything. Heaven, there is business that is being transacted in heaven, and he's drawn into the business of heaven, and he's drawn into, hallelujah, the worship of heaven. 
I just have to stop right now. And, and if you say in your mind or if you have any doubts that there is no God or that there is no Holy Spirit, then you tell me how the program that you received this morning, the words on the program, the worship, the exhortation, the exhortations that happened this morning match up exactly with the word I'm preaching this morning. Amen. How does that happen? Amen. But God, amen? amen. But God, and I, I promise you, we don't all meet on a Wednesday or Thursday and say, what are you doing? What are you doing? Now, what are you doing? And put it all together. But it all landed squarely for a place in time such as this. Let me get back to the message. So, so he is in this place, this business of worship. And, and I guess the question I would pose is, what is it about this worship in heaven that, that causes John to write about this worship in such detail. There, certainly there are so many other things he could be writing about, but most of this chapter 5 is about the worship in heaven. Now, now, yes, we all agree that Jesus is worthy to be praised. Why? Because he saved us, right? He delivered us. He redeemed us. But that's, that's just a part of it. That's not all of it. That's there's more happening in heaven that brings forth this worship. And that's what I want to talk about today. See, John's glimpse of glory reveals transactions that are happening in heaven that, that to you and me are still yet to come. Now, I, I mean, just stick with me this morning. It's going to get a little tricky, a little, little it's, it'll be a little deep. We're going to get in the weeds a little bit, but, but I pray to God that the Holy Spirit, you will make this um, relevant and you will make it palpable. So, so even after we are raptured, even after we are taken home, eternity's business continues. It continues. There's stuff happening even after we get to heaven. Revelation 5 gives us a greater understanding and a greater appreciation for all of these things. So here we are, we're in, we're in chapter 5, and, and at this particular time, John is shown a revelation of the transactions and, and the business that's transpiring. This is happening during the tribulation period, if we were to put it on a, a timeline, okay? This is happening after we've all been raptured, and we're in heaven, and the earth is going through this tribulation period. Once the rapture occurs, a chain of events is begun on earth and begins in heaven. Okay, this is crazy. This is, this is uh, uh, just mind-blowing when you think that when all this started in Genesis, we talk about this upper story and this lower story. So there are things happening in heaven at the same time things are happening in earth, and God is orchestrating it so that when we broke away from the glory of God and from heaven with sin, with Adam in the garden, we went two separate paths, but God has been orchestrating this plan to bring it all back together. Okay? Because we are his first love. And the whole Bible, everything in that book that you have in your hands is about him throughout history orchestrating events so that we all come back together again. Amen? So that hasn't happened yet. We're not, in chapter 5, that still hasn't happened yet. We've been raptured. We're in heaven. But we're, it's still not all the way together yet. We're, we're about right here. So that's, that's what I'm talking about, this chain of events. It's a, a part of chain of, of events that's called the 70th, 70th week of Daniel. And Jeremiah, the prophet, called it a time of Jacob's trouble. It's also known as the day of the Lord by several prophets. But what you need to know is that it's the worst time ever in the earth's history. This tribulation is the worst time ever. It's a time of complete unrest and, and catastrophe. You don't want to be here for that, okay? You want to be part of that, 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 that ship that took off a little bit earlier to heaven, right? A part of that group, a part of that posse that rolled up to heaven a little bit earlier. You don't want to be there. But here's another thing. Here's how God works. There's still just a little bit of grace left because during that time on earth, it's also a time of awesome and great revival. His grace, even at that point, has not totally run dry yet. There's still a chance. 
but boy, will it be hard. Yeah. Revelation 5 gives um, God's plan and God's hand in all of this, and it, it takes us to a place called heaven. Something must happen in heaven in order for earth to be redeemed. In order for eternity to be settled, something still has to take place. It is only by this important transaction that I'll be talking to you about that the world, that the earth that is going through tribulation can be reclaimed. Things have to happen there so that this down here can be reclaimed. And it's by this necessary chain of events that worship is elevated anew. Oh, see, worship takes on a whole new meaning, okay, because of what I'm about to talk to you about today. So today, I want to talk to you from the title, A New Song. Yeah, hmm, 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 seems like I just heard that. I want to talk to you from the title, A New Song. See, during our time today, I'll be sharing four characteristics about heaven while I'm explaining to you this, this new song. There are many more characteristics about heaven, but we only have time for four this morning. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm taking my time this morning, all right? I know the hour is late, but I'm taking my time. The first thing I want you to know about heaven, and it may seem obvious, but I have to say it, heaven is a real place. Heaven is a real place. It, it's not a metaphor. It's not a symbol. It, it's not some feel-good thing that we make up when people are going through a rough day. It's not a fairy tale that we use to give people just a little bit of hope when they had a tough time. Heaven is real. Now, if you have your, your, your Bibles, and, and John, I know I have for this to be a slide change, I think. Don't, don't change it. Uh, I marked that incorrectly. But if you, if you have your Bibles, um, if you look at chapter 5 of Reve Revelation, and you should be there right now, the first words that jump off of the page... Um, are, and I saw. Now, if you go to verse 2, just jump over to verse 2. It says, then I saw. And if you were to scoot up to verse 6 real quick, it says, and I looked and behold. Now, why do I bring that to your attention? Because John is actually there. He is actually visiting this place. He's there. It's not a figment of his um, imagination. He is there in heaven. He's been caught up. He is being given a personal tour through heaven. His experiences and, and everything that he senses are real. His visual and auditory experiences are very real, and they support everything that happens in this great book called Revelations. As a matter of fact, the words, I looked, is found 12 times in Revelation. The words I saw is found 34 times in Revelation. And even I heard is 26 times just in this one book. So he is fully entering into his immersive visual and audio experience. And all of his senses are awake and aware of what's going on around him. He didn't just have some bad Chinese food before he went to bed. This is real. And since we're counting, by the way, I found another number that's pretty cool. Did you know that heaven is found over 530 times in the Bible? Do you think it's important? Do you think heaven is important to God? Do you think it's important that he knows that, that we know that there is a heaven? 530 plus times. Whenever it's spoken about, it's spoken about as a very real place. As a matter of fact, we, we read it last week. I'll read it again. Jesus gives his word. He puts his very word, his promise behind the realness of what is heaven. He said to his disciples in my father's house, what? There are many rooms or many mansions, depending on what version. And, and then he says something that I love. He says, if it were not so, I wouldn't have told you. Jesus said, I'm not pulling your leg. I'm not just trying to make you feel good. I'm not, I'm not just trying to put you at ease. If it weren't true, I would have never mentioned it. Like, I'm a, I'm a loving guy, and I'm a cool guy, but I don't just tell jokes. I mean, this is real. And, and he said, the cool thing is he said, I'm going there 
ahead of you guys to prepare a place for you. That tells me that heaven is a real place. Amen? The Apostle Paul wrote, he, he went as far as to say that our citizenship is in heaven. Heaven is our home, sweet home, saints. Every important thing known to a believer is in heaven. Have you ever stopped to think about that? Anything that's important is in heaven. The Father is in heaven. The Savior is in heaven. Your comforter is in heaven heaven. Your reward is in heaven. Your riches are in heaven. All of God's people throughout all of history are in heaven. It's our home sweet home. It's where I want to be. It's where I want to go. That's why Paul said that, that for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Think about that the next time that you're at a funeral and you're, you're mourning the loss of a loved one. It's, it's I mean, it, we, we're sad because we miss that person. And that person has, has been tremendous in our lives and we'll always remember them. But man, there should be a spirit of celebration inside of us too. Because if they're saved, then they are receiving the rewards, the riches, the, the, the uh, father, the savior, the comforter, all of those things I just said, they're getting when they leave this world. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, so here's John here. He's ushered through the doors of heaven. Remember, he said the door is open, and, and he went through it. And here's John. He's trying to take this all in, right? In chapter 4 um, from last week, we, we talked about he sees, um, the first thing he sees when he walks in the door to heaven is what? You guys remember? The throne. Right? He is drawn to this throne, and, and he's drawn to the throne, and he uses this word that I keyed in on last week. The Holy Spirit put it on me. Behold. <laughs> behold. And I was like, why, Holy Spirit, why do you keep giving me this word, behold? And, and Thursday night helped a little bit, actually. Behold is a great Bible word. It's a real cool Bible word. Behold denotes something remarkable about to happen. Behold means don't miss this, or look what I'm about to do, or you've got to see this, or whoa, man. Whoa, behold. Okay, so here it is. I just want to read with that context. I want to reread something that I, I read last week, and if you want to flip back to Revelation chapter 4, starting with verse 2. And this is John as he walks, walks through the door of heaven. He says, immediately, and then immediately, I was in the spirit. So as soon as he walks through that door, he is hardwired into what he sees. You guys miss that. See, this is, where, this is where water church is maturing to. So that when you walk in this door, the Holy Spirit is here, and instantly you are plugged into the spirit when you walk into this place. I don't care if we're meeting in a parking lot. I don't care if we're meeting uh, uh, on the street somewhere or a building, wherever, okay? Because that is what heaven is. He walks in the door and immediately he says, I was in the spirit. And there's that word. He goes, and behold, I was in the spirit. And whoa, <laughs> you got to see this. A throne is set in heaven. And one, I love this because in your Bible, that should be capitalized. And one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow all around him in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes. And they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne preceding lightnings and thunderings and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Hallelujah. I don't even know what all that means, but it sure sounds good, right? But we'll try to break it down a little bit. John, he's attempting to describe 
what I would like to call the ultimate adventure. It's the ultimate adventure. That he's trying to describe this divine light show. He has no references for it. He'd never seen fireworks or laser displays or anything. He's doing his best to, in his words, to describe what he's seeing. An emerald rainbow around the throne of God and the one that sat on the throne with his brilliant uh, iridescent set of stones that adorned him. Could you imagine what John must be seeing? Heaven is amazingly uh, incomparable to anything that we know. Even today with all the stuff we see on TV and social media and everything that technology could see, heaven is, is so much we don't even have the vocabulary to describe it. You can't compare heaven to anything. But author Randy Alcorn, who wrote a book entitled Heaven, says something that, that is so true. And it even happened last week um, on one of our social media accounts as people commented on the sermon from last week, people who don't go here. But, but Satan labors to give people an inaccurate view of what heaven is. He works at it. It's on his checklist. It's what he does. He, that's his job every day is how can I tear down this heaven thing? Because the last thing he wants is for one of us or someone who is unsaved, especially to get a, a glimpse of what glory looks like and give their lives to Christ. So he's doing everything he can. He writes that our enemy slanders three things, God's person, God's people, and God's place. Some of Satan's favorite lies are lies that concern heaven. Some of his favorite lies. It, it makes sense because if you all remember, Satan was booted out of heaven. Right? He got the hook. He got kicked out. He can't, he can't reside there anymore. So Satan is motivated to tear down heaven because you who are saved will spend eternity there. He's motivated to de-glorify heaven. That's why you see, and you would think it's innocent, but we get images of chubby angels with little harps on clouds, right? Bad jokes about Peter being at the gate of heaven. You see illustrations of heaven, and there's this balding old guy, God, with the long gray beard and a dingy schmock or whatever that's kind of checking people into heaven like he's a Walmart attender, Right? <laughs> You've seen the pictures before, right? I'm like, maybe I'm a sinner, but hey, if I'm nice to God, he'll let me in anyway, right? I can, he's my dude, right? Right, so, but th these are the pictures that we get of heaven, and I'm t here to tell you that heaven is nothing like that. The devil is a liar. Heaven is a, a real place. It's not a cartoon. It's not the butt of some joke. Heaven is real. My second point. Heaven is a relevant place. Heaven is a relevant place. It's important. Heaven's an important place because there are serious transactions that take place in heaven that bring about eternity in the glory of God and his kingdom. So heaven is a relevant place. Revelation, if you pop back over to chapter 5, verse 1, John recounts this. He says, and I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll. It was written inside and on the back. It was sealed with seven seals. And when I saw a, I love this, when I saw a strong angel, now aren't angels strong anyway? But this one must have stood out because he says, then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and loose its seals. Now, wait a minute. If the strong angel is crying out, who is worthy? Obviously, that angel didn't have the power or the worthiness to open this. So let's back up. Let's talk about scrolls. Bear with me as we get in the weeds, but I'm going somewhere. We know that scrolls were ancient documents preceding books, right? They were used before books to write stuff down. They were rolled on both ends, right? You've seen the pictures of scrolls before towards the center. Now, a portion would be written on, the scroll would be turned, 
and so on. This would happen. You ride on a little bit, you turn. You ride on a little bit and turn. Now, every time it would turn, it would be sealed by wax so it couldn't be open unless it was broken. Okay? So that's what's going on right now. More would be written. It would be turned. Okay? Then it would be sealed with the wax. And then a little more would be written. It would be turned, sealed with wax, and so on and so forth. So Bible scholar Robert Thomas said that that Hebrew documents most closely resembling this description of scrolls I'm giving you that are described here in Revelation, the most common use of this type of scrolls as described here was an ancient title deed to property. A title deed to property. Hmm. Interesting that we're talking about title deeds to properties. Um, just saying. So literally I had chills this week. I was like, whoa, okay, that's going in the sermon. So, so um, deeds were drawn up for the transactions of a piece of property, right? And on the inside of the scroll, they wrote out all their assets, okay? And on the outside of the scroll were written the requirements to buy that piece of property or, if you remember in the Old Testament, or to buy it back. Now, why do you say buy it back, Pastor? Because you remember in the Old Testament, land in Israel, you couldn't lose it. Like if you lost it, someone else in your family had the right to buy it back. Okay, so it never transferred out of the family. It could never be permanently lost. I'm going somewhere. Stick with me. Now, if you had to forfeit your piece of land, eventually somebody who was related to you, who was willing and who was able to pay the price could come along and reclaim the land. I'm going somewhere. The person in Hebrew, Dr. Paul, is called a goel or a kinsman redeemer. You've heard that before. He has to be related. These are the requirements. He has to have the money or the capital to get the land. And he has to be willing to do it. Now, I commented to Dr. Paul because what I did was just describe the whole book of Ruth to you, right? And that's what he just taught about a few, week, uh, a few months ago. See, the land is lost in Ruth, right? Elimelech, Elimelech, the owner, dies. And then the widow and her daughters, daughters-in-law, move into Me to Bethlehem. The land is then put up for buyback, right? For buyback redemption. You see where I'm going. Boaz, who is related, he meets all the requirements. He's able and he's willing and he gets his hand on the land and the bride and he finalizes the deal and he becomes the kinsman redeemer. Amen? And they live happily ever after. Yay! <laughs> right? So that's, just, that's the story of the book of Ruth. Why are you telling me about the book of Ruth, Pastor? I thought we were talking about heaven. So what is significant about this scroll in heaven in Revelation 5 is that first, it's highly significant because it's in the right hand of God, right? It says in his right hand, so that's significant. Second, it involves the fate of everything and everybody on earth. Finally, finally, we know it's significant because after this whole matter is settled, there's this jubilant praise that erupts when someone is found who can be that kinsman redeemer to redeem that land that was lost. Yes, I'm, I'm suggesting that the scroll is a type of title deed for the earth. It's a type of title deed. That, that being the case, Revelation 5 in real estate terms is really the closing of the deal. That's what's being transacted in Revelation 5. He's closing the deal on earth. So why would God, somebody's asking right now, why would God who created everything, maintains everything, and has all power, why would he need to buy or redeem the earth? Why would he need to do that? It's because of what I've been telling you guys every week. Earth is lost. It's lost. Even though it's God's creation, it was lost to an usurper, which is the devil, right? Right? Adam turned over the title deed. He gave him the title deed to the earth in the Garden of Eden. He turned it over to him. This is why Paul said in, in, in Romans 5 and 12, 
Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. It wasn't people, it wasn't just people who were affected by this transaction, but property was affected by it too. This land, the earth, everything, it, it was all affected. It was all turned over to Satan. The earth itself is under a curse. Paul further wrote in Romans 8 and 20, for the creation was subjected to the creation, meaning us and the earth, was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because of him. See, through the Bible, Satan is referred to as possessing the earth. Throughout the Bible. It's not just in one place. Throughout the Bible, it talks about Satan possessing the earth. Paul called Satan the God of this age, little g. He called him the God of this age. Jesus called him the ruler of this world on many occasions in the Bible. John said the whole world is under the sway of the wicked one. Jesus if you remember, when he was tempted after fasting was taken up to a high place, right? Matthew um, 4 and 8, and, and I'll read that for you. Matthew 4, 8, 9, he says, Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I give you if you fall down and worship me. Now, who is the devil to promise Jesus something that he created? But the truth of the matter is the transaction was made and all the kingdoms of the earth are under the control of the devil. Jesus rebuked Satan for, for this offer, but he rebuked him for saying, worship me, right? He's like, no, you, you, you worship me. I don't worship you. But if you notice in the following verses, Jesus never says, well, by the way, you don't even own that stuff. <laughs> nah, 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 nah. He never said that, right? <laughs> because it's true that Satan did have control over the kingdoms of the earth. So the next time you get fighting, swinging mad about the stuff that goes on in government, and about the way an election goes or the way something transpires overseas or a war or something like that, you just need to know Satan is in control of all of that. That's why we as a church are told to pray for our leaders, Amen. right? And to pray over them, whoever they are. There's enough evil behind the scenes all by itself, regardless of who you like. All of them are being greatly influenced by evil. And it's up to the church to rally behind them and pray. If we have any chance of things working out from a governmental standpoint. Unfortunately, I hate to be, you know, the, to, you know, to mess up your breakfast or whatever else. It's all lost anyway. Thank you. Good night. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> So this scroll that we're talking about, guys, the scroll that we're talking about, it's a type of title deed to the planet Earth, okay? And as each seal is broken, the Earth gets purged through unimaginable tribulation and judgment, as described if you turn to, to chapter 6 of Revelation and continues all the way through chapter 19. I probably won't do that sermon. You just need to know it's bad, okay? <laughs> It's real bad, okay? So this goes from about 6 through 19, but it's also a scroll, praise God, of redemption. Amen. It's a scroll of redemption because during that time, it says that 144,000 Jews will be saved during that time of tribulation, and an innumerable amount of Gentiles will be saved in the earth. So it's a time of redemption, too. So the question is asked, is posed in heaven. Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose the seals? Who can do this? Who's the right person? Who even has the authority to take the scroll out of the hand of God? Who has the divine right 
to take that scroll? Who has the innate virtuous worthiness to take this scroll or the character to have this scroll? Who has the power to defeat Satan and to wipe sin from the earth? Who can do this? Who can reverse the curse? Who's worthy? And there's something very troubling happens if you look at um, verse 3 of chapter 5. If you want to read that with me, it says, And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. The question is asked, and it's crickets. Silence. Nobody answers. Nobody steps forward. Of all the millions of angels, Gabriel, Michael, none of them step forward. No one says a thing. No one says, I'll do it. Abraham, the, the father of our faith, he doesn't step forward. and He didn't say anything. All the prophets, none of them step forward. Isaac, Jacob, Elijah, uh, Amos, Zephaniah, Zechariah, even David the mighty warrior, none of them stepped forward to take that scroll. No one says, I'm worthy or claims to be able to do anything uh, with that scroll. None of them claims to have that power. And, and, and verse 4, John honestly writes, so I wept much. Because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or even to look at it. Folks, I'm telling you, this, this is that time before every tear was, was wiped from the eye that's mentioned later on, okay? There's still crying going on in heaven. There's still some unrest. Everything's not settled yet. And here's John. He's sobbing. The Greek translation said that he cried convulsively. He's crying to the point where he can't even catch his breath because he knows we're so close to saving the earth, and if somebody would just take that scroll, if somebody could open that scroll, then, then the earth could be saved and God's kingdom could be established. But he's crying because it's silence in heaven. Theologian W.A. Chriswall writes, bear with me, I, I thought this was great. He said, John's tears represent the tears of all God's people throughout all the centuries. They're the tears of Adam and Eve as they viewed the still form of their dead son, Abel, and sensed the awful consequences for their disobedience. These are the tears of the children of Israel in bondage as they cried to God for deliverance from their affliction and their slavery. These are the sobs and the tears wrung from the hearts and the souls of God's people as they stood beside the graves of their loved ones and experienced indescribable heart and disappointments of life. Such is the curse that sin has laid upon God's beautiful creation. No wonder John wept so fervently. If no redeemer could be found to remove this curse, it meant that God's creation was forever consigned to remain in the hands of Satan. It's not looking good in verse 4. But I love what happens in verse 5. I love what happens, especially after what we talked about last week. But one of the elders said to me, who are the elders? Who are the 24 elders? You guys remember from last week? We said the elders represent the church. Not only is there worship in heaven, but there is a ministry going on in heaven. And one of the elders who represent us said to John, do not weep. Behold, look at this. Whoa, do you see it? The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Hallelujah. It took the church, this great man of God, John, who wrote all this and wrote several books in the Bible, who was faithful, who knew Jesus as a person on this earth, who knew Jesus. It took the church to encourage him. Man, the church, man, the church. Guys, we, the church, are not some leftover flunkies chasing a dream. We are royalty. 
We are the elders that will sit in heaven. We will minister. We will serve in heaven. We will sit on thrones in heaven. So this takes me to my third characteristic of heaven. Heaven is a redemptive place. It's a redemptive place. So the elders are saying, John, stop crying. Behold, look who's coming. And he points to and he describes, using his Old Testament reference, he describes the Messiah. And he calls him the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And this refers back to Genesis 49, where the tribe of Judah is described as a lion. The term used here is to convey a ferocity, okay, a, a, a roar, a real menacing presence, a, a power, because that's what lions do, right? That's, that's what a lion is. So this Messiah, this is the Messiah that the Jews had hoped for when Jesus originally came, right? They were looking for that lion because it had been talked about in the Old Testament. That lion that was roaring, that was ready to take over, that was ruling, that was king of the jungle. That's what, that's what they wanted originally. But Jesus wasn't that in his first coming, right? We know that he was humble and he, was, he made himself a sacrifice and he was humiliated, but for a purpose. Amen? But this Jesus that I'm talking about right now, this Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah, anticipates his second coming. This lion of the tribe of Judah is like uh, um, C.S. Lewis's Aslam. He's on the move. He's on the move, right? Jesus is the lion of the tribe of of Judah. So the, the elders say, behold, they say, whoa, dude, did you see that? Are you seeing this? Look at this. The lion is here. The lion of the tribe of Judah. So John in verse six says, I looked <laughs> and behold, <laughs> here's another behold, right? I looked and whoa, <laughs> in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain. Wait a minute, but you just told me to look at this lion. I turn around, look over my shoulder, and there's a lamb. A kind of beaten up looking lamb, too. I'm looking for this lion that you're telling me about. This is Revelation speak for the lion was the lamb, and the lamb was the lion. See, we see him here all in one, wrapped in as the same. 29 times in Revelation do they refer to Jesus as a lamb. Okay, But this is a very different kind of lamb here in verse 6. If you continue reading, it says, He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Now, I'm a, I'm a city boy, so I had to check. All right, I Googled. I called my friend Google. I said, Google, do lambs have horns? And I checked, and, and Google told me, he said, lambs never have horns. Some adult breeds have horns, but lambs, lambs never have horns. Horns are a symbol of his strength and his authority. The idea that, that there are seven, and seven being the number of completion, suggests that he is omnipotent. Well, that's another big word. What does that mean? He is all-powerful. He's got, nobody can stop him. No one can challenge him. He's all-powerful. He has all the authority. He doesn't have to check in with anyone. Moreover, it says that he has seven eyes. Now, eyes, they reference his insight, his knowledge, his wisdom, his understanding. Again, seven being the number of completion, it means that he, he's omniscience. Omniscient means that he knows everything. This lamb knows everything and has all the power. And then there's this mention of the seven spirits of God. Um, that's the sevenfold spirit of God, okay? And that's a whole sermon in its own right, but if you go to Isaiah 11 and 2, you can see some of that happening. Isaiah 11 and 2. These are all Old Testament analogies that are being brought forward into Revelation. Again, you got this story, right? 
and it's all coming back together masterfully. Now, these pictures convey that the lamb is perfect, right? He's perfect in strength. He's perfect in knowledge. And he's perfect in presence. I'll say it again. He's perfect in strength. He's perfect in knowledge. And he's perfect in presence. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the lamb of God. Amen. Amen. Now, I need to share with you just one more thing, one more very important detail about the lamb. The lamb is described as looking like it has been slain. Now, now, it's alive. It has to be alive because the lamb is what took the scroll out of the hand of God. It's, it's moving around. It's walking. So we know it's alive, but it's bearing marks of violence as if someone tried to kill it. John is giving us a picture of what Jesus will be in heaven. Mm. Hang in there with me. When Jesus rose from the dead, you'll remember he still bore the marks of crucifixion. Do you remember what Thomas, he said, put your hands here, right? He still bore those marks. Even in his glorified and resurrected body, he had the marks. When he ascended to heaven, as far as we know, he still had the marks. According to John, in heaven, he still has the marks. It doesn't mean that he could not get rid of them if he wanted to. He has the power to do that. But he's chosen, at least from everything we read, to keep the marks. Could it be, and here's a thought, and I had to write this down. Could it be that the only remaining work of man in heaven are the marks of crucifixion that we put on our Lord? Could it be? And here's the thing. It wouldn't be to shame us. For Jesus, it would be a badge of honor and of glory to remind us, you are worth this to me. What kind of king do we serve? Hallelujah. This is why he's qualified to take the scroll. Remember, there are three requirements to, to redeem or to buy back a, a title deed and a, and a piece of property that's been lost. Does he meet them? The first thing is you have to be related. We, we know he's related because he, he came here and he put on flesh and he lived with us. Amen. He lived among us. The second thing is you have to be willing. Well, we know he's willing because he died for us. And the third thing is you have to have the means or the capital to be able to purchase it. And we know that because he paid with his most precious blood. In verse nine, the elders acknowledge for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood, by your blood, which brings me to my fourth and final characteristic of heaven. Heaven is a responsive place. It's a responsive place. You got your Bibles? Because we're about to read right now. This is the response. This is the response that takes place in heaven when the lamb, the lion of Judah, takes the scroll and breaks the seal. Verse 8. Now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders, which represent the church, fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Ha! Huh. And they sang a new song. Why is it a new song, church? Because the songs we sing now are, are because he saved us. But after this happens in the future and after uh, uh, he comes and saves the earth for all of eternity by taking the scroll, they're not singing the old songs of Zion anymore. They're singing a new song. And spontaneously they began singing, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain. And have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And have made us kings and priests to our God. And we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne. The living creatures 
and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands and thousands. Now, I'm just an Akron public school boy, but I did my math, and that's like 100 million plus, plus, plus. Saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessings. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard them saying, Blessings and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and they worshiped him who lives forever and ever. Hallelujah. 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 So there is a response in heaven and the fitting response to taking the title deed, uh, redeeming the whole world for all of eternity, for taking it and saving the world from tribulation and, and, and judgment to get it back from the control of Satan. The fitting response is worship, 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 worship. That's why everything that happened here this morning was decent and in order. If anything, we didn't do it enough this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, it's worship. He is worthy. Worthy is the lamb. Not just for what he's already done, but for what he's going to do. You see, these transactions happen, to, they, they need to happen in heaven in order for the earth to be settled and his kingdom to be established on earth and in heaven. Amen. He's not just going to blow up the earth and say later for them. He's going to come back here and shake it all out and clean it up and straighten it out. And you who are his servants, the 24 elders, you will be worshiping in heaven. But not only will you be worshiping, but you will be serving in heaven. Wait a minute. Not only will you be serving in heaven, but you will be reigning princes and, and, and princesses and, 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 and all the offices you will hold on earth. You will go back and forth as dignitaries, representatives of the kingdom of God. In this new kingdom, in this new established kingdom that God promises you, why wouldn't anybody want to be a part of that? Amen. Why wouldn't I want to sign up for that? Amen. Why would I deny who he is now and miss out on all of that? What an adventure it will be. Amen. Amen. It's already an adventure, right? Being a Christian is already an adventure, right? <laughs> Sometimes better than others. But... There, there's coming a day where we are going to be riding high in the glory of God Amen. forever and ever and ever. And then there is that verse that comes later on in the book of Revelation where every tear will be dried. And there won't be any more crying or worrying or anything like that. Hallelujah. That's coming. Amen. And we want to save as many. We want to get as many people on the train to heaven as we can right now. Right. But if they don't want to, I'm not losing any sleep over. Them. I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to I'm going to preach the gospel to them. I'm going to do everything I can to help them. But if they just say, hell no, because that's where they want to go. You brush off my shoes, keep moving. And that's what I would tell you all to learn to do. Do the best you can. But do not get bogged down in the affairs of this world. You got too much other important Amen. stuff to do. Amen. You got too many people who, who need to know Jesus, who want to know Jesus, right? So let's waste our time, not waste, let's spend our time on those and not waste our time on those people who aren't ever going to change. Yeah. That's where we're going to right now, right? When we go into this new building, this is, these are the things we need to look at. Where are we devoting our energy and our resources, Right? I mean, we're going to be tired. It's, it's going to be hard work. It's a heavy lift. Praise God. Behold. 
Look at that. Whoa. Did you see that? Behold. Right, and that's the back, right? If y'all, they wouldn't be able to handle the front, Louise. No, I'm kidding. I don't want us to get, I'm, I'm happy for this opportunity, but I don't want us to get so beholden to a building. We're still the church of the living God. We, me and you, all of us, right? That's just a home base. That's just a place where we can lay our hat down while we go out and do the work, right? One of, one of the vision points was we want to be a church without walls. That means we got to get outside the church and make stuff happen, amen? So just wrapping it up, John is in heaven. He's, he's utterly in, overwhelmed by this worship that's taking place. He's not bored by the worship, right? He's captivated by the power and the details of this new song. This new song blows him away. He writes it down word for word. It's a song like none other that he's heard before. And now he understands why, because he got to witness this transaction. And hopefully now you understand when you hear those words, why that song was so powerful, because there's this transaction. There's this moment of tension that didn't look good in heaven. And here comes the lion of the tribe of Judah to save the day. Amen. There, amen. You can give him praise for that. There's nothing more fascinating than God, especially when you're face-to-face with God. There's nothing more fascinating. The God that went to Calvary and died for the remission of our sins, is, he's, that's fantastic, that's what we know, but, but the only one in heaven or on earth who was worthy to, to break open that seal, that's something else. That's something, that's another dimension of what God is going to do for us, what Jesus is going to do. He still has work to be done. Remember, we're talking about all this stuff is going to happen in the future, right? All this stuff is coming, right? He is the son of man. He is the Lord of glory. He is the lamb that was slain. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Amen. 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 Blessings and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Give me praise right now. Hallelujah.